Hey everybody, welcome to a mailbag episode of the podcast. I'm of course Samson Folk and I took around 40 questions from people on Twitter. I'll be answering all of them. And if you want to be able to ask me these types of questions for mailbag episodes, just make sure you follow me on Twitter. And I also know that with the subscription model this year, we're looking at, or I'm looking at particularly, less people reading my work. It's just not as far a reach. The Athletic did this everywhere there's subscriptions. It doesn't reach as far, but you have people paying for it. That's good. To the people paying for it, thank you. Um, but additionally, my work uh, doesn't reach as many people. And perhaps some of the people asking me these questions here, you could have known the answer prior to this, maybe even like a month and a half. Maybe if you've been reading my work, some of these answers like years in advance, um, if you subscribe and you read my written work. Uh, something to keep in mind. I appreciate it if you have the means and the inclination. Thank you so much. But the first question is from Blake Murphy. Quote, the Raptors never played like this really until you started covering the team full time. Why haven't you taken accountability? And you know what? I have the first year that I started working with the Raptors Republic. The Raptors won the championship. It's of note. Would you would you rather would you trade anything for that championship? Probably not. So let's just, you know, pump the brakes. But also, uh, yeah, maybe maybe I need to be bringing better vibes into the practice facility or, or the games or something like that. But I I generally think they're they're decent, but it could be my fault. That's that's certainly something to consider. Um, it, I'll, I'll investigate this within myself and see if there's accountability that needs to be taken. The next question is from Freddie Rivas of the wonderful Confederacy of Dunks podcast. Quote, I've never been in the room, and I'm sure it's pretty intense, but do you think folks should be asking Coach Nurse tougher questions? End quote. Okay, so use the term folks here. And it's important that you understand, Freddie, that I am the only folk in these pressers. The only one. So is this a call to action? I'm left to wonder. Uh, you didn't say, but do you think any Granges should be asking Coach Nurse tougher questions? You're putting it on me. Um, I haven't asked Nick a tough question since prior to the season when I was asking about the starting lineup and he was upset about it. Uh, but mostly I've been talking to the players. Uh, I haven't had that many questions for Coach Nurse, truthfully. Could he be asked tougher questions? I think he could. But the difficult thing about coaching in the NBA or observing coaching is that most people don't know, even myself, I'm about to you know, talk out of my butt to some degree, right? Because I've never been a coach in the NBA. And coaches, I think, like Nurse, got too much credit in the past for other players' performances because he was dubbed, like, the genius. But right now, the team can't shoot, and he's getting a lot of the flack with other things. And also with minutes, too, it's like the Raptors this year, for the most part, have tried to play a deeper lineup. It's just they've had so many injuries. And we, when we look at the, the Orlando game in particular, they had three guys with the 905, and they still had a bunch of injuries, like Otto's out, Precious is out, right? And that's interesting. But he, he plays guys too many minutes. I think there could be a bit too much hubris in how he approaches his offensive ideologies and the defensive ideology, which we'll get into further. But, man, uh, he could be asked tougher questions. But it's tough to frame it as if it's the coach's fault because you have to have an extremely um, wide knowledge base of how basketball is being played, how schemes both offensively and defensively intersect with what the opponent's trying to do. And to ask these questions in a decent manner, you have to know what both teams tried to do on the floor. Like let's say you know the Raptors play Golden State and the Raptors – they're getting killed coming off of pin down. So they start top blocking. And then when they start top blocking, they start getting killed on back cuts and stuff like that. It's, you know, how many of the people in the room are going to be able to kind of vocalize that and say, why did you make this decision? Wouldn't you rather maybe deal with the volatility of the three point shot rather than allow layups at the back but basket? Why did you top lock instead of maybe switching these actions or something like that? It's hard to vocalize that stuff. And it's also, you have a diminishing return on the types of answers you get because Nick Nurse does not like to talk about X's and O's whatsoever, which sucks for a guy like me, but it's just tough. Um, 
and then otherwise it's like how do you how do you ask something without being accusatory maybe because it is just basketball right um there isn't I, I don't I don't think there's anything nefarious going on so it's it's tough to frame these tough questions that are based on play style or performance let's say and say like why aren't you doing something and or maybe are you asking like should he be asked questions that invite more criticism of players or something like that? I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some stuff left on the table um, objectively. Am I the guy who's going to go grill him? My coverage prior to being in the rooms and stuff like that was not like grill the coach, grill the players type of coverage. I like to highlight what's working and what isn't working. I like to talk about what's being, what's happening on the court and I typically don't give coaches much credit for anything. Um, I think that they're important to some degree, but uh, I, I'm i not the guy probably to go in and, and start grilling Nicholas Nurse, as it were. So now we have a, a trio of Fred questions. So Fred has had a, a really tough start to the year, obviously. He's mired in the worst shooting slump of his career as far as he's been in a rotation. It's been bad. So we have the three different questions from AC No Winter, from Spain PNR FTW, and from Jeff Lowe. So from AC, quote, what's your worry meter for Fred? Do you believe this is an extended slump or just an aggressive beginning to a decline in ability? From Spain PNR FTW, right in this instance, what's the maximum contract you would feel comfortable giving Fred years and per year salary? And then Jeff Lowe, would you extend Fred Van Vliet? So Fred's extension, I believe he's eligible for a four-year, $114 million extension, which I think is close to $28.5 million a year. Uh, what would I be comfortable giving him? Would I extend him? Am I worried about him? I am worried about Fred. I think that Fred, we've seen a decline in some of his athleticism, some of his burst, and that has affected his ability to beat guys at the point of attack on both ends. Uh, We're also seeing, as Nick Nurse said at practice the other day, the way that he's missing his shots is new. Fred, when he misses his shots, is either typically in his career short or long, but he's missing on the separate axis now. And that means he's missing left and right. And Nurse said in his study of jump shooters, that isn't typical for once you decide or once you figure out you're shooting the ball straight, typically you shoot it straight. Something is going on with Fred that he's not shooting the ball straight anymore. Nick Nurse said they're going to get in the gym. They're going to figure it out. We'll see. Uh, He's had way more experience trying to tweak jump shots than I ever had, have had. And on top of that, Uh, I'm not in the gym like that. Practices, sometimes we see the very tail end of it. We see guys working on things individually by the time we come in, but we can't really parse out what's being worked on. We we just kind of see the fluff at the end of it. Would I extend him? No, I wouldn't extend Fred. What's the maximum contract you would feel comfortable giving Fred? Years and per year salary? I won't answer that now because I don't have to and neither do the Raptors. Like, I wouldn't extend Fred. So the contract's off the table. You talk about it when it comes to the end of the season after Fred unfortunately has to prove or buckle to the idea that his body is not in the same place that it has been in the past. And that isn't his fault. He's been played hard uh, for years and his body is responding to it, it seems. We have to see if it can make that bounce back. And do I believe this is an extended slump or just an aggressive beginning to a decline in ability? Oh, man. I think that this is an aggressive slump. And I do also think that we are seeing a subtle decline in ability. Uh, I, I don't like speaking ill of players. And Fred, certainly, he gives it his all. But there are certain deficiencies he was able to overcome offensively and physically with tremendous shooting ability. That tremendous shooting ability, I doubt, has gone away. So that will help lift some of this stuff up. But the ability to get past guys with his dribble and the ability to stick with guys with a live dribble has changed. And uh, we have to see, you know, maybe he needs an extended time off. We see players take a year off, come back, and typically it's with a new team, right? And they find find their health again. And they kind of work within the parameters of, 
their new athleticism or whatever. But Fred, athletically, he he does look different. That doesn't mean he's not still he still has tremendous feel relative to most of the players on the court. He's very cerebral, very intelligent player. He makes like great decisions as a rotating defender, but his body is not conveying him around the court that it used to. And that is not his fault, I have to add. So that's the Fred Van Vliet stuff. Thanks for writing in, fellas. The next one is from Eric Kareen. He says, who shouldn't the Raptors trade? My response to this on Twitter was Jeff Doughton is untouchable. Uh, of course, Pascal Siakam shouldn't be traded. Uh, you're not, the, the Raptors have never, they got Kawhi. They haven't gotten close outside of that to trading for a player of Pascal's quality. In fact, Pascal is having a better year now than I would say any that DeMar DeRozan or Kyle Lowry had. Um, Pascal, his peak is one of the greatest that the franchise has ever seen. And he's also one of the best players in the league. You don't trade that. I also think you don't trade OG. OG is both underrated, underpaid, and vastly better than what most people think and he's incredibly important and I still think he has room for growth you don't trade OG Ananobi um that's the other guys I think on the roster like I guess OG you could include in a wider package or something I don't know what's coming back but I just largely I don't I don't think you trade OG he's such a good player and he's you keep a guy like that on your team for as long as you possibly can and you see where the small steps come uh, along with that that great defense as well. Defensive player of the year, first team all defense, level defense. Fred, Scotty, Precious are probably the next three guys as far as value. Precious, I'm so interested to see what it looks like once he comes back. There's some starting lineup questions later on in the mailbag that uh, we'll talk a bit more Precious. But uh, Fred and, and Scotty, during the summer, I was saying that, yes, I'm one of the people who said I would include Scotty in a Kevin Durant package. And I still feel the same way now. I don't feel worse about Scotty than I did in the summer. I'm not worried about Scotty currently, but I, I, I would trade Scotty for a superstar, yes. Uh, I would also trade Fred for a superstar, yes. And uh, yeah, so I think it's OG and Pascal and Pascal above all else, honestly. Uh, that's, but I'm certainly not advocating for all these guys to be traded. I'm just saying like, I just can't see a a way that the Raptors should trade Pascal, a player of that caliber and win a trade because that, that would be really difficult. Uh, thanks for writing in Eric. Okay. Let's do the Scotty questions. Now there's three or four of them, maybe five or six, uh, from Luke quote, do you see a reason why Scotty has seemed to struggle so much finishing at the rim this season? down 7% over last year from Joe Wolfond. Do Scotty's defensive struggles have more to do with physical limitations or mental miscues? And which one of those things is more likely to improve in the next year or two? From Cooked at Get Fred a Floater, was Scotty's athleticism overrated coming into the draft? From Elon Musk is a broke boy. Is Scotty Barnes better than Mo Wagner? And then, okay, so those are the Scotty questions. I'll answer... Okay, so we'll start with Luke's regarding the lower um, efficiency at the rim. And yeah, I think there's a pretty obvious answer, and this one is two-pronged. It's that Scotty has been dealing with more help defense this season than he has in seasons past. Uh, The one season past, I should say. He's a sophomore. And the reason why that is, is not only that he's been playing against teams that are more engaged to stop him. The Raptors have been dealing with injuries that typically allow better spacing and for more creation from other parts of the roster. So Scotty got more isolations, got more space to work with, and wasn't dealing with the second level of defense as much last season. And then the you know more troubling part, because a lot of guys struggle with adjusting to the second level of the defense, is that Scotty appears to be um, missing some pop athletically. Being able to plant on one leg, um, explosion off of both, side to side quickness, all that kind of stuff is not at the same place that it was last season. And this is what happens with players. You know, you get used to the toll that your body pays and you have to find counters because a lot of guys are banged up. Scotty is currently trying to find those right now. 
and he has been struggling immensely with the second level of the defense and having less physical pop. For a guy who dominated physically in his rookie year because he had such an advanced body, he was big, he was strong, he, he knew how to use it, and he was willing to challenge people with his body. He didn't shy away from contact. He invited it, right? The fact that he's lost some of that, and that's not to say he's lost it forever, but that he's currently working with a depleted level of athleticism with teams that really care more about stopping him from getting to that spot on the floor, that is why he's down 7%, and that's why he's getting to the rim less frequently than last season. And from Cooked, was Scotty's athleticism overrated coming into the draft? Um, it depends. If you listened to podcasts that I did around that time, I did one with PD Webb where we talked about Scotty's limited athleticism. And if you read the piece I wrote with an MD um, called The Biomechanics of Scotty Barnes, we talk about the limitations of his body as well. And there are things that based on body type that some guys have a certain proclivity to do. And based on your body type, players come up with different biomechanical answers. For example, many of you know Lewis Satzman. Lewis Satzman, when he drives, is not a two-stride guy. Lewis Satzman is a hop-step driver. That is the answer to how he navigates the lane. I am a long-stride driver. That is the way I attack the basket. These are the, these are the ways that our bodies came up with. This is my counter to the defense. This is how I try and get to spots. Some of it's based on craft. Some of it's based on body measurements. Some of it's based on explosiveness. But this is what it does. And this happens for, of course, NBA players. OG Ananobi and Scotty Barnes both have high hips. Both have long legs. Both have to figure out how they navigate situations athletically with those things going on. Core strength comes into it. Uh, quad strength comes into it. All this type of stuff comes into it. You have to implement yourself properly. Scotty, for defending at the point of attack and defending a lot of actions at the NBA level, doesn't have his answers quite yet. He could figure them out, and then all of that gets much better. But currently, he doesn't have the burst or, or the pop to guard a lot of the actions that he loved guarding in college. And he's been a bad point of attack defender last season and this season, uh, objectively, I think. And that's maybe people having... I guess the wrong idea about his type of athleticism and just assuming that if you have a certain type of athleticism, you can be in, inputted into any situation and navigate it perfectly. But the, the truth of the matter is that certain types of athleticism, certain measurements, all that kind of stuff do better in certain spots as opposed to others. And Scotty, if you thought he was a guy who can stick with guards, then yes, his athleticism was overrated coming into the draft. Or I guess out of the draft, whatever. But if you listen to PD Webb come on the podcast after you know the Raptors drafted Scotty, we talked about how he probably wasn't going to have success at the point of attack and how his elite future as a defender was off ball where he gets to cover big space. And to get even more specific, if we talk about what I did with Polar, the MD, talking about biomechanics, it's that when you have long legs and high hips, it's harder to navigate small areas of the court and stuff like that, like screen navigation and all that. And when you get to play in the big areas with big, long strides and all that kind of stuff, that's where you get to show off. And Scotty is being put in a lot of point of attack situations. So that's a little bit difficult for him. So overrated, underrated is always about perception, of course. And for those who understood it, I think Scotty is doing about what was expected. For those who didn't, maybe it's kind of tough. And then, yeah, so talking with Joe Wolfond, right? So the Scotty's defensive struggles, physical limitations, or mental miscues, which one of those things is more likely to improve in the next year or two? Um, they're both a big deal because what Scotty has these physical limitations, of course, that he can't keep up with a lot of the guys he wants to keep up with, but he pursues them like he's Davion Mitchell, like he's the most rapid, strongest little 6'3 power punch point of attack defender, and he gets blown by a lot. If Scotty, with his length, played with more tact at the point of attack, and this is kind of what OG Ananobi is capable of doing is like keep guys in the space that you feel comfortable to contest and kind of bother their dribble. That's what OG does. OG for a long time, you know, wasn't like a big on ball thief. 
he was a big, big time passing lane thief. But on ball, it's about suppression and it's about containment. And Scotty does not worry about suppression or containment. That uh, those mental miscues at the point of attack, I think he can switch around fairly quickly. Um, a bit of a different approach. And then even just last night when I believe it was Franz Wagner hit that three or maybe Mo Bamba, I can't remember. But Scotty, he just floated off of his guy when he wasn't supposed to. Pascal was already making the rotation up to the shooter. Scotty floated over to the shooter as well. It led to a wide open three. And Scotty has a lot. He's the guy who puts his arms up at the end of these possessions. But typically he's at fault. And that's difficult to see. But Scotty, a lot of the times is making rotations that either aren't his or he isn't making rotations that are. And he has to strike that balance the way that everybody does on the Raptors. And those mental miscues, I think, are easier to solve than uh, physical limitations because part of the mental miscues is already adjusting to your physical limitations and knowing like, hey, I should be playing this way because this is advantageous to my style. And uh, he doesn't have the full picture of what works for him yet. And I think that, uh, you know, every player as they come into the league and learn what works now and what doesn't relative to college and high school and all that kind of stuff, they get humbled and learn and uh, they have their response as well. Scotty is currently in the humbling phase that many players go through. His response should be intriguing and worthwhile. So something to keep an eye on there. And then, yeah, is Scotty Barnes better than Mo Wagner? Yes, uh, Scotty Barnes is better than Mo Wagner. Although Mo Wagner is a nice little player out of Orlando. Uh, I thought it was hilarious uh, when the Raptors played it, <laughs> the Magic. Mo Bamba got in, uh, interviewed at halftime. He had a very good first half. And they asked him what was working. And he said, well, Mo wasn't looking at the rim when he was in here. So I thought I'd just come in and put the ball on the ground and attack. And I was like, wow, I can't believe he put his teammate on blast like that. But... He probably wants to start instead of Mo, and he probably wants more minutes than him too. So I thought that was uh, kind of funny. Okay, next question is from T. Quote, how would the offense change with a Yak Pirtle acquisition? Is he a good enough pick and roll roller where we would see an uptick in that frequency? How confident are you in his dunker spot finishing? Okay, so that's a really good question because Jakob Pirtle is good enough to dictate that the Raptors move more so towards that. But what this is the chicken or the egg thing is that Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Vliet haven't played with a talented roller in a long time. Even like Serge Ibaka was a short roller or a pick and popper. Marcus Gasol basically was a pick and popper and, you know, a short roller sometimes. Uh, that's when Pascal and Fred have been, you know, handling the ball in these types of actions and Pascal much less so. Aaron Baines, uh, Kem Birch, Coloco, like Precious Achua, none of these guys would, they don't dictate that you work to them as rollers and try and accentuate them. Pirtle is of that, that group of players, even including Serge and Mark, definitely the best roller. Uh, short roll, he has massive, massive volume in the short mid range. He shoots really well from the short mid range. He shoots really well at the rim. Uh, you know, how confident am I in his dunker spot finishing? I very confident. I think that he would be a very good punch at the end of these plays that when we look at Coloco, who clearly needs to get better offensively, we're looking at a guy that isn't able to finish in those spots. We're looking at Chris Boucher, who depending on the matchup on the other side is kind of hit or miss sometimes on finishing on the inside. It's Pirtle would make a sizable difference. The only thing and in dunker spot finishing, I think short mid like the short mid range, that short rolling Pirtle is going to be a big boon for the Raptors if he's on the team. Dunker spot finishing, big boon for the Raptors if he's on the team. Rolling all the way to the rim, though, I'm not certain because Fred is not a talented, uh, he's not good at getting his bigs all the way to the rim. He doesn't make those types of passes. He typically doesn't worry the defense to open up those types of passes, those passing lanes. And Pascal. For all the things that Pascal is, which Pascal is phenomenal, he is a tremendous player, one of the best players in the league. He is not a pace, pick and roll player. And that doesn't mean you don't run pick and roll with him because you run pick and roll with Pascal to get him into the middle. It's truly a scoring play for Pascal You and, and mismatches and all that kind of stuff. And you let the play play out from there. 
But as far as Pascal having like an elite roller or something, Pascal isn't a guy like Chris Paul or Trey Young or Luca. He doesn't operate at that pace where he's like getting downhill, surveying the court and getting into that floater slash lob. Like he doesn't weaponize rollers with his decision making. And that doesn't mean he's bad. It's just different players have different proclivities to how they want to play. And Pascal, because he's never had a roller while he's progressed into a star, not not for a moment in time, he doesn't really look for rollers. I, like this is an interesting aspect of his game. He was, this is about, this is also a developmental thing too, right? Is you have to have players who encourage some sort of development or who give you a reward in development while you're doing it. Otherwise you just don't learn that. And Pascal, we haven't seen him look for rollers as he's going downhill at a high volume because he's never had a roller who generates a tag or he's never had a roller who's like bursting into space for like can get into contested airspace for a lob or a roller who's like sealing and bursting into the rim and maintaining the pocket. And so Pascal, we don't even really know what it would look like at high volume. So Pirtle would change it to some degree, I think. To what degree, I wonder. And also, uh, yeah, if if I wouldn't, I would not be opposed to Pirtle on the Raptors whatsoever. Um, you can quibble about the price being paid for him and all that kind of stuff, but I think Pirtle would be a positive addition, uh, no question about it. So yeah, thanks for thanks for the question. So from Masai Crush Mondays quote. Nurse's defense seems to require a lot of energy, but does it require any more energy than your typical NBA defense? Could it negatively impact players physically injuries or even mentally, you know, burn them out to disengagement end quote. Okay. So yes, nurse's defense requires a lot of energy and does it require more energy? I think so. Yes. Um, objectively, I think it does. The Raptors in miles traveled, they're up there. The Raptors in closeouts are always up there. They start behind the eight ball. They trust their length and athleticism to allow them to keep corralling the eight ball into safer spots of the court. They have not been good at this that this year. Uh, the rim frequency is up from last season. They defend the rim worse than last season. They still allow the most corner threes in the NBA. That's all bad. And those are things you don't want to sacrifice on the floor. And the Raptors continue to sacrifice them. And they still have a good defensive rating, which is insane to me. But it's it's not, we know that this defense is not the picture of what it's supposed to be. And yeah, it's way harder. You're, you're asking players to travel more miles on the court. You're asking players to rebound more at certain positions, to bang around at certain positions more so than they would otherwise. You're asking players to guard up most of the time and if they're not guarding up they happen to be playing the three where they're bigger they still have to come help out it's it's a very taxing style of play which is why i wanted the raptors last season with precious at in particular to play a little bit more drop and to um to try and make sure that like hey we we can play like a more conservative calm down knuckleball at these teams and we can save a bit of energy we can keep the play in front of us like that instead of getting behind the play and catching up and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Precious has been injured. They've played drop with Coloco, and that has gone poorly. It's tough to play drop at the NBA level. Um, for anybody who you know is interested in what Coloco doesn't drop, I did film review with him. We went over film together. I wrote about it. I also watched every single pick and roll possession he's defended this season. That's on RaptorsRepublic.com. If you have a subscription, you can read it. If you don't, there should be three or four of the videos that Christian and I went over where you can see us talking about it um, before the paywall comes up. So something to keep an eye on. And could it negatively affect players as far as like the physicality of it affecting them and the burnout affecting them? 100%. Of course, yes. Um, a good question because some of these things just have to be said out loud. Uh, yeah, so thanks for writing in. Okay, so let's answer this one then because this is related from... Raptors underscore enjoyer. Are these struggles a team wide slump that will correct, or are they indicative of deeper flaws with the team, i.e., roster balance schemes, etc.? So, we talked about some of the problems with the scheme. The scheme is <laughs> the scheme requires a lot of energy, it requires a lot of length, and it requires a lot of discipline and connectivity. The Raptors haven't had connectivity because of so many injuries 
they haven't had as much energy because of so many injuries and they still were an inconsistent team last year at performing this defense and even as the raptors were one of the best defenses in the second half of last season for a really long stretch they still got blown up their first two pl- first two games they played in the playoffs this is a very tough scheme to enact and the raptors we see it positively affect guys like Chris Boucher. We see it positively affect guys like Juancho Hernan Gomez. We see it positively affect guys like Gary Trent Jr. All of those guys to varying degrees. I think Juancho and Chris really both benefit from making sure that you stay connected to your guys. It's not so much about sticking somebody. It's about being willing to rotate and know where you're supposed to be. Chris and Juancho have done a great job. Gary Trent Jr., a guy who you know, when it comes to ball pressure and gambles and all that kind of stuff is asked to do that kind of stuff. And then his point of attack defense isn't quite as important as his ability to play make off ball um, in this in this scheme. So that's all like worth noting. But they struggle. It, It looks really bad if you can't do it because you're giving up so much and so many of the traditional aspects of basketball that are still foundational and fundamental. The Raptors are struggling to maintain. And, you know, like giving a guy a wide open shot from the corner, that's tough. And the Raptors still do it. Giving guys lanes to the rim and asking for that democratic rim protection where everybody's rotating over all that kind of stuff. If you don't rotate in time, it's a it's a layup against typically a smaller player who isn't quite as good as deterring shots at the rim as a lot of the bigger players in the NBA. Or in this case, Christian Coloco, who's foul heavy, sometimes out of position, and while he is tremendously talented at blocking shots and contesting, is still a rookie who's selected in the second round who can't be asked to completely carry the back line of a defense. And then if you do rotate in time, you have to see the ball go to the corner and somebody else has to make that rotation out there. And then somebody has to cover for them because they pulled off of the guy above the break. And it's very tough to maintain that. So there are issues on this roster when the Raptors aren't playing their best basketball. When they play their best basketball, the ceiling's very high. They cause a lot of turnovers. They can move anybody when they're connected. They can move you around the court, passing the ball for like 22 seconds, and they can put you in a very precarious position. And they can do it for many, many um, possessions at a time. We've seen it this year, just not consistently enough. That is a problem of scheme. There is also a problem of roster balance in that there isn't enough shot creation on the the team and there isn't enough shooting on the team. The struggles will improve. Um, There's also like it's a team wide slump and there are struggles. The team wide slump is exacerbating all of these struggles because the Raptors, for what it's worth, when they don't score the ball properly because they can't shoot the hell out of the ball. You know, they're shooting, I believe, 28.9 percent from three over their last 15 games when they can't shoot the ball. You get more runouts the other way. You don't get to set up your defense. That's a big deal. The Raptors, it's important for it's important for any team to set up their defense. The Raptors have the worst half court offense in the NBA currently, I believe, 30th. They are facing a lot of set defenses. If they don't face a set defense, they they have a much better chance at scoring. So there is a lot going on. Some of it's scheme, some of it is roster imbalance, and some of it is that slump. There are bad things, but the bad things are not as bad as they currently seem. But it ex- it continues to be true that things can be bad, I suppose. <laughs> and so to to stay on topic is from Kai, who is a staff writer at Rappers Republic, has done so much good work this season. Kai French Fry on Twitter. Follow him. Keep up with his work. And you don't have to pay for his. So everything's free. Just like keep reading Kai because it's so much good stuff. Anyway, quote, If the Raptors were to tweak their defensive scheme, what are some changes you'd want to see? Okay, so a lot of this does hinge on Precious Achua to some degree. If they if they are going to keep playing Christian Coloco, as I said in that piece I wrote, the the secret to their success was not playing him in drop, but playing him higher, closer to the level of the screen, and then pinching in above the break on a lot of these actions to make it kind of claustrophobic for ball handlers and you know using the back line to cover to cover ground and having the guys come downhill in rotation instead of uphill in rotation i think that there's some wisdom in that and they it would help to be consistent with that um on top of that 
the Raptors could they could employ more switch. They could especially employ more nexting and peel switching. And so the nexting, I mean, they do do it. It depends who's on ball and it depends who's off of it. That's what really matters. The Raptors are pinching in so hard a lot of the time that they could turn it into a next. Like they, a guy pinches in, right? And you could just have them rotate over. That's that's how much they're coming. It's like it's a dig, but they're like stutter stepping into it. They're they're trying to beat a guy to a spot and dig. It's like that guy could just rotate over, and the player on ball could shoot over to the next guy. They could do that more often. They could also peel switch more often if they want to be able to guard the corners better while still allowing some of that, um, still not being able to stop the ball above the break. Someone gets downhill, peel switch to the corner, have have the guy step up. And since you are supposed to be multifunctional and have like versatile defenders, having a guy step up and then assume that switch for the rest of the play, that shouldn't be a super big deal. Instead of, I guess, trying to play from behind more often, it's it's tough. I uh, truthfully, I need to see Precious in here and healthy to kind of see where the Raptors are because. And maybe, you know, maybe people think I'm too high on Precious, but Precious was one of the best defenders on the team last year. They did end up as a good defensive team last season. And during the Raptors' best stretch defensively, um, Precious gave OG a run for his money as best defender on the team. That's who they've been missing for this extended period of time. He may help solve a lot of what they do defensively if Nick Nurse plays him and it doesn't lambast him in media and stuff like that. We'll see. Um, this question, I will have a much better answer to February 7th uh, when there's an, like, you can come watch us talk in person. We'll have, uh, I guess, uh, yeah. Um, I'll put the details in the description, but you can come watch everybody. If you want to listen to basketball talk, you can do so. Um, but I need more minutes with Precious and more health to be able to answer this question really well. Okay, from this one is from Rupert Nuttall, quote, from a coaching perspective, is there any way the current squad can run a passable half-court offense? If yes, how? If no, why not, and what needs to change? Passable, 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 passable. I think, so let's say passable is what? Middle of the pack. Let's say that's what that is. With Pascal on the floor, the Raptors prior to injury, prior to everybody being terrible shooting from three, they had a passable half-court offense with Pascal on the floor, and that's because his creation was so robust. It is that lack of pace in the pick and roll that the Raptors have, be it with Pascal because he operates differently and still successfully, and Fred because he tries to operate as if he were one of those robust creation guards, but falls short, still providing some value there, but falls shorter than than a lot of his contemporaries at that particular play type. The Raptors, they have a tough time leaning into pick and roll. They lean further into the mismatch stuff, and they don't, as far as, far as to my eye, make a lot of the cuts that are scripted or triggered. So in an NBA offense, typically there's a lot of these triggering points that schematically players know when to cut. If if this happens on the court, you make this cut. If the defense responds to the cut in this way, this guy should be open or this guy should make this move up here, like all this kind of stuff, right? So a pick and roll comes and let's say the guy from above the break on the weak side makes a 45 cut. He drags the weak side zone defender in with him the guy whether you know if he's a good above the break shooter and it depends on how much the defense is responding to it but if the guys are really good above the break shooter maybe he shakes up he lifts up to above the break and he's wide open from three maybe if he's a more limited shooter he sticks in the corner and he has a wide open jump shot right it, maybe that skip pass comes and it probably would be harder to rotate as a defender up above the break than to the corner but it depends on what the shooter is doing. Like this type of stuff gets triggered by actions all the time. And the Raptors, because of this read and react aspect, they don't seem to have as many triggers, which means that a lot of guys off ball are not doing a lot. And that makes the defense look or the offense look really static. 
And so when guys aren't doing that, that's a problem because you're basically just standing around asking a guy to like, hey, I'm going to be right here. Create like just smash the defense up, rotate them into hell and try and create a shot for me. I'll be here. Hopefully the ball comes to me. I'm open. And then even when they're doing that now, they're still not hitting their open jump shots, which is a big problem for what it's worth. Um, The Raptors also, I think, have a problem with a lot of guys. This ranges from stars all the way down to the bottom of the roster. (sighs) They don't sell their actions because the Raptors, even though they are read and react, they still run a lot of actions. Every NBA team does. But guys are too often going through the motions of the actions. And so some of that is coaching, not being able to coach guys up and say like, hey, you got to sell this, man. Like believe in this action as a decoy and sell it like you're going to get the ball. Some of that's coaching. Some of that's on players. That's a very fine balance to critique. I I couldn't go in on either one, really. Um, and, And being able to sell actions is extremely important because if t- this is why when teams know what you're running, they have a really, really good chance of stopping it because they know where you want the ball to end up and they know by what instrument or means you want to get the ball there and they can navigate everything accordingly. If you are as a guy who like, let's say the Raptors want to w- run an action out of the corner, right? 21, any delay, whatever. And they want to have Thaddeus Young playmaking at the top. The ball eventually gets to him. But If you're coming off a pin down or something like that or a wide pin and you're doing it just ho-hum, the defense doesn't have to play up on it. They can play back and be like, okay, he hasn't even squared his shoulders. His body is pointed almost towards his own basket. This guy is just getting the ball to move it along. Like that is a big problem. That's not something that the Raptors, like you can't get around because their creation isn't robust enough and guys are not selling their actions enough. That plus, I, I don't think the Raptors, I don't think enough is designed for them. I've I've been saying this for some time. I did like at the start of the season, the Raptors did lean into more of the pick and roll actions and more, I guess I would say, creative ways to screen for Pascal and get him into more dangerous spots on the floor. That has still stuck around, albeit at a little bit lower volume. That's been really nice to see. But I think there's a lack of imagination sometimes in the way that they weaponize the other guys on the floor, be it Scotty, OG, or Fred. And it's a lot harder to critique this stuff because even if Fred is open for three right now, he's not hitting. Even if OG is open for three right now, he's not hitting. And Scotty Barnes is having trouble navigating the inside. Using actions to weaponize these guys in these ways is not really, it's not moving anything right now because the intended outcome that you're supposed to be able to hit is not happening even when you achieve the process you want. The outcome isn't matching it. So that's been tough. I- extremely tough, I-, I suppose. But yeah, can they get to a passable half-court offense? Honestly, if Fred is this inconsistent physically, like he's just missing some of that burst, I don't think so with this roster. The only thing that could change that, I think, is if Precious Achua is a high-volume three-point shooter, catch and shoot between like 37 and 40%. Because if if you collapse the defense, the ball swings to him, and defenses have to contend with like, okay, you know, the 37% three-point shooter or Precious putting the ball down and getting to the rim, that makes the Raptors a lot more dangerous. Although, I don't think it's fair to assume that he's there yet. He had a stretch, a good one, um, but we have to see it. He has to prove it. So yeah, I, I don't think the creation is robust enough from OG or um, robust enough from from Fred to support Pascal to the point where the Raptors can be passable in the half court. There are things they can do, some try hard things that will definitely make them more dangerous. But even then, middle of the pack in half court offense, I don't think so. I think they need. Uh, more offensive talent on the roster to achieve that that standing. Oh, here's a here's a fun one. Do you th- um, from Nirvana underscore ASDF? Do you think Nick Nurse is a top coach in the NBA? This is the man. It's so tough to answer questions about coaches because, again, a lot of coaching is implementing scheme, how players respond to it. 
and how you manage personalities. So from the outside looking in, I would say that Nick Nurse discusses his players in a more harsh way than a lot of coaches that I've seen. I personally disagree with that. I am not on the Nick, you know, critique somebody, suddenly they play awesome type train. I I don't agree with that. And in fact, sometimes when he's critiquing guys, I think that it's in the wrong place. Like Gary, you know, bringing up his deflections at that point in time, Gary getting 2.4 deflections a game instead of 3.4 is, and saying that out to media is a, I don't think that's good as optically. If you're going to critique Gary's defense, critique it. Don't give the NBA stats.com stat that is publicly available and say like, oh yeah, this is, this is the thing. Go get more deflections. You'll play more or something like that. Or when he was saying that precious defensively, he was giving very, very vague descriptions of it. And when you do that, you give everybody else the license to go watch precious and pay attention and be like, where's he making mistakes? Where's he making mistakes? And so for people who don't know, every, OG makes mistakes. He's a defensive player of the year candidate. He makes mistakes. All players make so many mistakes defensively every game. Draymond Green, the most cerebral defensive player of the past however many years, makes so many mistakes de- defensively every game. If you tell people to start looking for it, they will find defensive mistakes. And even worse, they will start prescribing other players' defensive mistakes to that player. It's just about being a little bit more, like looking out for your guys as a coach. I think I disagree with, with what Nick is doing there wholeheartedly. I, I hate, hate that. As far as a guy who has come into the league and been willing to try a wider range of defensive schemes and to kind of toggle them in game, and when he had a lot of the talent on the roster to be able to get outcomes out of that, I think he's been tremendous in that way. The offense has always been, always been underwhelming for me. Uh, I'm not a, I've never been a big fan of the way that he approaches offense. I know a lot of people like James Borrego or Monty Williams, who you see a lot of set actions. You see a lot of really clever um, off ball occupying the weak side actions that are incorporating the stuff. It's five guys who are paying attention and playing to the offensive scheme at once. Whereas the Raptors, it's like two or three guys are engaged at once and there's not a lot going on. Um, I thought the offense was always difficult, but all that being said, his ability to make the right call schematically, defensively, when the team is going, I think is really good. And to implement them, really good. I still think Nick Nurse is probably a top coach in the NBA. But again, this doesn't mean much coming from me because I don't see him talking to the guys. I don't see him sit down with Scotty and talk about like, hey, so here's what happens. Like You're getting fronted in the post. This is what I want you to do in response. This is what works really well for the team. We don't see any of that. So it's very hard to critique it. But the the things publicly that I know, um, a mixed bag, but he's also, he's won a championship. And he did match Mark's minutes to Embiid. He did give Fred a license to shoot after Fred was having one of the worst shooting performances in the playoffs that we've ever seen. He did pull triggers on rotations that ended up working. He did say, hey, Marcus Saul is this big guy, but we're going to have him blitz Steph Curry in the finals. Like, There's been so many good decisions made by him in that respect that I think he's still a top coach in the NBA. And he's still, when he has the guys, I think does make good decisions. But heavy minutes, open critique of his players, perhaps some hubris. Um, There's some stuff that you could kind of, you know, raise your eyebrows at. But again, it's very tough to uh, commend coaches. It's very tough to critique coaches because your understanding of the game has to be so fundamental. Like you have to understand so much of what's going on and you have to know it at an elite level. It's just, it's tough. Okay, here's a good one from Rowan Hamilton. Quote, do you think the Raptors management overestimates their development staff? There's so little offensive talent on this team, and they're just relying on nurse and team to find a way to make non-shooters and non-shot creators viable. Is it hubris after years of praise? This, this is the great question. This is the conversation I've been having for like well over a year at this point, is that 
are the Raptors going with Vision 6-9 because they think the offensive rebounding and the length on defense and all that kind of stuff is a guaranteed baseline of playing these types of players and that you work on your ceiling by adding offensive utility slowly to all these kind of guys. And it just so happens that Pascal Siakam has one of the most intriguing and fantastical development arcs of any NBA player ever. And Fred Van Vliet goes from undrafted to an all-star and all, the, all this type of stuff, right? Chris Boucher is one of the best bench players in the NBA after being in the G League, all that. They still very much miss a lot of the stuff that we're used to seeing from offenses, all that kind of stuff. It's tough, man. Um, do the Raptors overestimate their development staff? Man, I don't know. I don't know if they overestimate their development staff because even Nick Nurse, when he talks about like the shooting, he says like it's we're on an 18 month timeline. The Raptors talk about improving. I don't know. You have to kind of pick up breadcrumbs to try and evaluate how they think about themselves. And that puts you in a position where it's really tough to assess anything, honestly. But I do think that the fan base overestimated the development staff uh that much i know because i saw the fan base openly commenting on it whether it was kem birch being waved by the magic and making a few you know corner threes with the raptors and then you know and everybody says like wow the raptors can teach anybody to shoot when it you know when it was pascal having the pull-up um three-point shot in 2019-20 and them saying like wow the raptors can teach anyone to shoot when it was every long wing that the Raptors had afterwards, OG, Scotty, whoever, that because Pascal, through his own work, his own development, that while, yes, some of it is coupled with the Raptors, is also Pascal's capacity for change, cap capacity for improvement, and willing to put in the work there, saying like, oh, the Raptors can make any wing into this viable creator, something like that. I think that's more so a fan base perspective that has been wrong. I also think that the Raptors, I just couldn't possibly know. I, I don't have somebody like in my ear whispering like, the Raptors think this. I'm on the inside and this is what the Raptors think. It's outrageous. I don't have anything like that. I can only speak to seeing fan base sentiment over the years. And fan base sentiment, there's definitely been hubris. There's definitely been like an elitism about like, we'll take anybody and make them into X and Y. And typically, those that hubris was based off of Pascal Siakam and Pascal Siakam is the only one who gets to say like I made me me and he certainly did uh, I wouldn't expect other people to have his progression uh, but the Raptors development staff coupled with him and worked with him on it and so there's credit to go around but most of it has to stay with Pascal and you can't just use him as the rule for how other players develop I, I suppose it's tough. They don't have enough shooting on the on the squad. They don't have enough offensive creation. You're absolutely correct. Okay, so here's an interesting one kind of in the same vein. Why do the Raptors keep releasing fringe bench players that become serviceable pieces in other organizations? Is this a Nick problem? So Yuta Watanabe would be the first example that comes to mind. Shooting the hell out of the ball. He's playing good defense. He's finishing at the rim a little bit. Uh... Utah did not shoot the hell out of the ball last year. He did play defense, and uh, he was really bad finishing at the rim. Like, if you made Utah put a dribble down last season, it did not end up well for the Raptors. Utah, I think, is also a guy who, with his controlled closeouts, he's, like, one of the best at it in the NBA. You know, some of that shorter rotations to the rim, not these big where you come from, like, corner to corner, all that kind of stuff. When Utah is in a more conservative defensive scheme, I think that he shines. And I also think that his shooting and his driving is more accentuated on the nets next to guys like Kyrie, next to guys like Kevin Durant, than it was on the Raptors. And that's just fit. And you can't change team dynamics to fit role players or end of bench players. And so what that means is guys like Utah, they have to go travel around until they find their spot. Cameron Payne, for example, could not cut it with the Raptors, went overseas, became like more familiar with a lot of those European sets offensively, how to run them, the trigger options and all this kind of stuff, and then came back with the Suns and did really, really well 
running their intricate, trigger heavy, screen heavy, like decision making heavy offense. And that's an example of like Cameron Payne would make no sense on the Raptors right now, but he certainly made sense for a time and will continue to make sense on the Suns doing that. And so I guess it's that O'Shea Brissett also makes sense. Um, O'Shea, that's a tough one because the Raptors had to pick between O'Shea and Utah and they chose Utah and Utah. So it's like that one is, we understand that too. O'Shea as well um, has gotten better at shooting. Uh, the defensive energy has been pretty good and some of the driving stuff remains interesting. But um, yeah, I don't think this is a problem for the Raptors or a Nick problem. I don't think that there's ever been somebody they've lost that will um, change the outcome of a season for them or optics for the team. I think what you have to do in these situations is say like, good for Utah for finding a spot for his game. O'Shea, good for him. Cameron Payne, good for him. Like, that's the approach I would take because it is when it comes to guys at the end of the bench, they are so talented, but they are so different. And it's more so about finding where you fit in rather than having a team say like, we will capitulate to what your, what your game needs, because as it has always been, the guys at the top end of these rosters dictate how teams look. And uh, these guys found spots. So good for them. Uh, There's another question from Matt John. Uh, I just want to read it out loud. I basically answered this. So, quote, do you think the Raptors are capable of moving away from the flex offense slash ISO pick your poison to something more traditional, like more pick and roll centric? And what would it take? End quote. Matt, uh, if you're listening, you've already heard my answer on this. Uh, Thank you for writing in, though. I do appreciate it. But uh, I managed to answer this question without reading it. So uh, thanks for thanks for writing in. Okay, from Gal Dagan. Quote, what should the Raptors be doing with Otto? They never successfully incorporated him into the offense and his limited playing time and injuries are shortening the runway. Is it possible they should already be thinking of looking elsewhere for what they were hoping to get? End quote. Oh, man. Hmm. I think it's okay to be sad and upset that Otto has been injured. Definitely. I, and there are some things within the Raptors offense that, and well done on observing this, his fit because there are some things where he fit really well, where like there's the shooting is there, the offensive rebounding is there. There's some connective passing, but as far as like in the pace of the offense and knowing like, Hey, you lift here. Hey, you're actually the man who comes to get the ball. And you, you like, you're the dribble handoff guy to move us on to the next action, all that kind of stuff. Like we're using you to convey the ball around the court here. You're a connective piece. He was laid on some of those actions. He struggled to step in to some degree. Uh, I think you just wait for him to get healthy. He's on a really great contract for what he provides when he's playing well. And that's that's what those contracts are for, honestly. So looking elsewhere, I mean, the Raptors should be looking elsewhere to improve their team, but not because Otto is injured. Just because they need to improve their team, basically, is what I would say. From Evan Gualberto, quote, Outside of the pick and roll, what do you think the most important action to be able to stop is in the league? End quote. Okay, this is funny. Um, I asked this question to Caitlin Cooper. She gave like a 10 minute answer about the ghost screen Chicago action. And she gave every single example of where it works and where it doesn't and why it's so difficult to stop no matter the skill set applying it offensively. So go to Indy Cornrows podcast and listen to her. I believe it's around the hour and 40 minute mark. Um, and her answer is tremendous. So Yeah, Evan, thanks for writing in. From Craven Science, quote, who is more likely to play their veterans into the ground this year, Nurse or Thibodeau? (sighs) I guess Nurse, probably. Um, But also, like, I'll say this. I I had this tweet about it after the Magic game. I talked about it a bit at the top of the podcast, but it's not really this year. I don't find that it's Nurse's fault. So there are some things that Nurse, when he's like, Scotty's ankle is fine. OG's fine. Like, we keep hearing that guys are fine, and then injuries come out afterwards. Is this Nurse's fault? As far as I understand how these teams are set up, Alex McKechnie and OG and Scotty and these guys they should be way closer on their health 
than Nurse and like Scotty and and Gary and OG and all these guys. Nurse should not be the one making these decisions. And I don't think he is. I think he's just stepping out in front of a camera and talking. So I think we as the media, you as fans, you hear things and they're like, well, Nurse is being dishonest or Nurse is playing him too much or whatever. But there's behind the scenes stuff going on, very intimate conversations between the, you know, the staff that the medical staff and the players who are injured. And that's the most important relationship. We aren't privy to that, though. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm not kicking it with Alex McKechnie before games or anything like that. I haven't even shook his hand this year and introduced myself, to be quite honest. But that's something to consider with this. And when the team was healthy, Nurse did extend the rotation for Wancho, for Thad, for Delano. So when he has the guys there, I think he's found some things that he likes, especially with Wancho and Thad. I am optimistic, optimistic that this won't be a huge problem this season. However, I think he played Fred too much last year. And, you know, and that's the other thing too, is like the coach makes the calls on minutes. You got to look out for your guys more. And Nurse, I, I would understand why people say he's not doing that. Um, yeah, so... It's a complex question, health between players, because it's not a player coach thing. It's a player organization thing. And uh, it's really, really tough to assess that kind of stuff. Um, from obnoxious OGN and OB Stan, quote, what can we do scheme wise to address current problems without a trade? Point Scotty. Um, I think I answered this mostly in the in the other stuff. So my apologies. Um, but I think this has been answered in the podcast. Uh, I've been talking for a while, and I think I have covered this. From Timothy, is Folk your real last name? Yes, it is. Uh, kind of funny. I talked to my friends about this question because I was like, damn, is Folk? Does it seem like a stage name? Because when I did a podcast with J.E. Skeets of No Dunks, uh, he also said, he was like, Samson Folk is a really great name for this business. You know, I was like, damn, I didn't know my name had that type of like punch. And uh, Kai, who is on staff at Raptors Republic, said he also thought my name was fake when he first saw it. I don't understand this phenomena. However, I think it's fair to say that people are, you know, it's being viewed that way. So I'm here to finally say it in front of everybody. Yes, folk is my last name, and that is that is real. I'm not doing this for clicks. This isn't a, a stage name or a pseudonym from David F quote Raptor player X is terrible. Should they trade player X for an excellent player? End quote. Excellent question, David. I love the easy ones. Yes, they should pl trade player X who is bad for uh, excellent player X elsewhere in the league. I agreed completely. I'm very glad you see the vision on this one from Brandon Markham quote, would it make sense for the team to restore the starting five with Gary Trent Jr. for stability and then sort out opportunities and rotations from there? Give Champagne a shot, Flynn or Doughton, etc. It was a neutral lineup last year, but it's comfortable together. Man, I have really liked Gary's minutes off the bench. I think that the I do think the starting lineup is precious once he's healthy. I think it's Fred, OG, Scotty. Precious and Pascal with Precious at the five for what it's worth. I And I answered this with Mac when we were talking about it on this reaction podcast. I don't really care. Or sorry, I answered this with Sean Woodley on his podcast. I don't really care if it's Coloco starting or Gary Trent Jr. starting. The Raptors, th neither lineup is working very well. They, they have to have things progress as far as what they're at, like shooting, defensive intensity defensive acumen like making better decisions they have to do all that kind of stuff before they worry about lineup configuration and the lineup configuration i don't think there's a home run waiting on the roster currently or the healthy roster i want to see them give it a shot with precious we haven't seen it i want to see them give it a shot with precious if it doesn't work with precious then i think you like 
not that Precious is the guy you trade or anything like that. I, I really hope Precious stays with the Raptors for a long time. But if it doesn't work with Precious, maybe you look at the, the trade market to shake something up. If you just can't find a starting lineup that works, that means to me that your team is not where it needs to be given the talent on the roster. So I would like to see them try with Precious first, see the returns of that, and then kind of work on everything going forward. But we'll see. And this kind of relates into this next one. Another question from Spain PNR FTW. If the goal is championship and not just injury lucking or favorable bracketing their way into a conference finals, do you think this core deserves further investment into it? Or is it time to start building the next core? Well, this depends on how you view Scotty and Pascal. I guess it depends on how you view the whole team. Uh, and also in the end, you don't just build a core and be like, okay, we build the next core now. That's not how it works. And teams that have tried to do that even loosely have had a lot of trouble. Uh, Pascal Siakam is one of the best players in the NBA. You keep him on your team until he says, get me out of here. And then after that, you say, is there anything we can do to convince you before you even go anywhere close to another thing like that? Um, OG is going to be extremely valuable and important to winning basketball. For years, Scotty Barnes, some people are lower on him now than they were at the start of the season. Me personally, I am not. Uh, Anybody who's familiar with my work, especially on this podcast, you will know what I've seen in the limitations of Scotty. You will know probably that his struggle this year, I don't find surprising. There are some things with aggression and some athletic limitations that he's had because of what seems to be injuries that have worsened it. But as far as the road bumps he's hitting, I think these were mostly predictable. I still feel very good about Scotty going into the future. Um, The Raptors are sidling two timelines, I suppose. And they don't necessarily have to choose. And there's another question about this, but... I would try and add to this roster this season. Um, I th- and I, w- I would see what happens. Because Pascal, you're going to give him... I think he's going to play himself into a Supermax. I think he gives Pascal the Supermax. Decisions have to be made elsewhere. But Pascal being this good means he keeps that timeline open where you try and add to it. Scotty, I think, has a high enough potential. Uh, Precious, I think, has high enough potential. OG... Um, is getting closer to the age where you stop talking about potential, but I still think he has room for improvement and he's already so good that you're in a fine position. Things haven't gone well now, and a lot of that is related to Fred, because when Fred plays well, the Raptors typically win. And that was what he said prior to the season two. He's like, if we win, um, I'll probably get paid pretty well, basically. Um, (laughs) That's not a direct quote. That's a, I'm combining a lot of the things that he said. So don't get this back to Fred. Fred, my apologies for for discussing this openly. Um, But yeah, basically, right? Like if he plays well, then the Raptors will probably be pretty damn good. And if they're pretty damn good, then they'll have a lot of reason to keep Fred on and all that kind of stuff. But um, I don't think uh, injury lucking or bracketing I'm not sure. Bracketing is very important in the NBA now. Matchups are way more important than they ever were. Uh, The the playoffs can go a lot of different ways now. Uh, Genuinely, I believe that. So that's interesting. Um, Building the next core, though, if you're suggesting like Fred goes out and you get like young assets or something, um, you probably alienate the type of basketball that Pascal wants to play as far as winning. If you do it with OG, uh, once again, uh, man, I don't know if you get back what you give out with OG, and certainly I don't think you do with Pascal. So building the next core, like, does that mean blow it up or whatever? I'm not sure, but uh, I don't agree with the the binary aspect of that. I think that there's a, a lot of nuance in team building for for sure. And then, yeah, so there's what is more likely to happen at the deadline from, oh, sorry, Seymour Dallas. <laughs> from Seymour Dallas, quote, what is more likely to happen at the deadline? A trade that makes us push towards trying to be a threat in the playoffs or a deal that would make the current roster take a step back for now. 
in favor of the future. I think it's I think it's definitely a trade that makes us push towards the uh, the playoffs for sure. Um, additionally, from Spain PNR FTW, Amen or Scoot when the time comes. I'm a Scoot guy. I'm a Scoot over Wemby guy. I really love Scoot's game. So uh, yeah. Um, from Larry Dushensky, quote: Do they trade for Cat in season or off season? Oh baby, dude, I have been praying on hands and knees for a Pascal Siakam, Carl Anthony Towns front court. I like Pascal is such a perfect player to pair with a lot of the big men in the NBA. Um, Nikola Jokic is probably the most potent pairing. Like a Pascal Siakam Jokic front court is just insanity. Just insanity. I understand why other teams, the fans and the actual teams are saying like, wow, we'd love to have Pascal Siakam. When Pascal was in the rumors all that time ago, yes, because teams are looking at that guy and saying, oh, he's being undervalued? Um, we think he's an all-out star. We'll take that guy for distressed assets, perhaps. Um, yeah. Cat, I don't know what the trade framework is. I would not say no to Carl Anthony Towns on the Raptors, and I'm sure most Raptors fans would say would disagree with me. I view Carl Anthony Towns differently than a lot of people, I think, um, by margins, I would say. I think he's better than most people think he is. And uh, I would love to see him on the Raptors. That would be awesome. Uh, really, really fun. Okay, Oleg, you want to evaluate some trades with me? All right. Okay. So, Oleg, scoot over here. Climb over the top. I have uh, trade suggestions that uh, people have sent to me. And there's a lot going on here. So, I just want to get you your opinion. So, to the Raptors, Jakob Pertl, Devontae Graham, Dyson Daniels to the Pelicans, Fred Van Vliet to the Spurs, Kem Birch, Jackson Hayes, and a first round pick. So the Raptors basically let's do it from the Raptors point of view, because every single trade everyone ever makes from the Raptors, like if you're a Raptors fan, you're going to make a trade that every other team hates, but the Raptors like. So from the Raptors point of view, Jakob Pertl, Devontae Graham, and Dyson Daniels for Kem Birch and Fred Van Vliet. All right, so uh, we get a comeback from Jakob Pertl, so that's a dub. Um, Devontae Graham is also, like, I'd say, yeah, like a very good comparison to Fred in terms of, like, ability and, like, probably better shooter now. No? <laughs> I, I mean, Fred, Fred has been, like, shooting it bad. Well, I guess, like, Fred is, like, such an all-star. <clears throat> he is an all-star, but I guess, like, defensive, defensively being able to keep up and, like, he's younger, so... The upside could be like um, being able to keep the same level of play, and then without having Fred Van Vliet, like his decline being a factor. Do you do you think they're a similar level of play? I I don't know. Like don't, it's, it's okay. It's like your opinion. Yeah, I just think that like they play. Well, I don't say they play similarly, but I just say I I think that like they could use Devontae Graham just as well as they're using Fred Van Vliet. Uh, his, like, ability – I feel like his ability to play could definitely um, translate to the Raptors' uh, schemes. But, yeah, I think that would be, like, a really interesting thing to do. But I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. So, Dyson Daniels. Yeah, I don't know what we, that guy is. You know him to some degree because you came. All, all us fellows went and watched the mm. Pelicans play. He's the rangy wing who's pretty strong. Like he's he's listed as a point guard here, mm. but he has some burgeoning on ball skills. He's a pretty slick passer. He does not shoot the ball well. Um, I think that he has like a significant, I would say, future as a finisher and uh, an interesting passer. We'll see how the jumper comes along. But the biggest aspect is his defense at six foot eight. Uh, right. Do you remember seeing any of him when we watched? I can't. I can't say I remember uh, much of that. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I can say that I remember him being a, like a defensive impact in terms of like me like seeing it and be like, oh my god, what is this? Who is this guy? Um, I'm not saying that he's not that guy. I'm just saying that I didn't see anything. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would be very interesting because six eight is always like adding to the lore of Raptors length, so that's always fun. Um, 
yeah, I think that like that'd be an interesting trade. But in terms of like my take being like like an intelligent, I can't make like a very good take right now because I don't know if I have seen enough of Devonte or even Di- Dyson Dinos recently. Okay, to the Raptors, Cal Kuzma, okay. Corey Kispert, to the Wizards, Gary Trent Jr. and two second round picks. I think that's really interesting. Uh, Corey Kispert, I have no idea. I haven't watched any Wizards games, but um, Cal Kuzma, just like the length, the um, and also his scoring ability, I think that would be just like a great burst for the Raptors that they need because for for one, the the, the injuries have been impacting me so much that like they just can't make shots. So like somebody who's a shot maker, that'd be great for them. Um, What's it, what's Corey Kisper's story though? Corey, he's he just played some some hoops at Gonzaga. <laughs> he's a movement shooter. That's what he's listed at is in, in like the trade, but that's that's like his whole bag. There's some other stuff going on there. Like he has size at the position. He has athletic deficiencies, I think, compared to some people. But we're looking at a guy that that I mean, they just spent a first round pick on him last season, mm-hmm. and this is only his second year. Also, Kyle Kuzma, I mean, yeah. Would I do this trade? I really like Kyle Kuzma. Mm-hmm. I, think I think I would do this trade, although I'd understand why people would want to. And Gary Trent Jr. also deserves a lot of love because he's been really great lately. Um, that's that's the trade. I, th- I think that, like, Gary Trent is, like, a good player for, you know, it's like he has, like, added a lot of stuff that, and uh, a lot of value to the Raptors' like offense, but at the same time, it's like there's there's a lot, a lot of limitations that are that I'm seeing that can definitely uh, limit their uh, like offense, um, like playoff, mm. uh, their playoff like uh, playoff ceiling, defense, and defense, and even like shot making because like penetration. The night he's not very good. Um, he's not a very good finisher at the rim. Kyle Kuzma is just taller, so like he can just shoot over people, and also probably make. He's a good off ball, uh, off ball player as well. So like I'd say like, I don't know. What do you think? I would probably do this trade. Mm-hmm. I don't think that the Wizards would though. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's the that's the trade stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for tuning thanks. in. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming to <laughs> shop it up. Okay, we have a few more. Yeah. <laughs> we have a few more questions before we get out of here. I think. Just two of them from Esfandiar Barahani. Who's your favorite non-Raptor to watch this season? Um, my answer at that point in time was you. And uh, because I've watched Esfandiar's videos that uh, and read the newsletter that he's been doing with the Steve Dangle Podcast Network. He's the NBA lead guy over there. He's done really cool stuff as far as like he traveled to Cleveland. He traveled to Detroit and is helping to tell the stories of those fan bases in those cities and intertwining them with food and basketball, Esthony Bourdain, as it were. So if there's anybody who's listening to the podcast, this you know mailbag at this point in time, uh, please consider checking out S's stuff because it's been truly, truly great this year. And the guy I've enjoyed watching the most in the NBA, oh man, I think I need to think about this for a moment. It's, man, hmm. I think I just have to say Zion. I know that's like a lazy answer, but there's a reason he's so captivating and everybody likes him. Yeah, Alec agrees. He likes watching Zion too. Um, he hates watching LeBron James though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the final question from Pulau Banchero. Banchero, sorry. Quote, if you had to adapt any NBA event slash incident into a movie, what would it be? Okay, I want the banana boat story. I want Jonathan Majors as LeBron. I want Daniel Kaluuya as Dwayne Wade. (laughs) I want John Boyega as Carmelo. (laughs) And who do we want as Chris Paul? Shamar Moore. That's what I'm going to say, Shamar Moore. And then, uh, yeah, Shamar Moore as uh, as Chris Paul. Of course, um, John Boyega <laughs> as Carmelo Anthony. 
uh, he won't be on the banana boat. He'll be, he'll be the narrator telling the story over top. He'll, and he'll introduce it as like, I never went on that boat. Uh, he, he can be the narrator. A leg wants Corey Hawkins as the narrator. Yeah. Okay. As Carmelo. Okay, as Carmelo. Wor- worth saying. Uh, I think that's it. It's like an hour and a half of just me talking. Uh, you can see the sun went down. It changed the way the lighting affected me. I did a wardrobe change. I drank some water. I did my thing. Thanks for tuning in. I hope the questions were answered uh, to your satisfaction. And uh, I hope you have just a wonderful uh, day, night, slash whatever when you listen to it. Please consider liking the video, uh, subscribing to the channel. If you're on the podcast channel, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for letting me talk to you. And uh, above all else, subscribe to Raptors Republic so more people read my work. And uh, I do think that the work is worth money. So thanks for tuning in. And whether you got into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye.